Good to see you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session. Um, in this next one and a half hour, we will be looking at uh, different tools 
um, and ways that these tools are being implemented uh, in order to help um, the uh, various, um, let's say, uh, uh, tools that can be used for enhancing uh, NDCs um, to support the implementation of um, nature-based solutions. And the first hour, we're going to discuss about how that is being implemented, some of these tools. We will discuss about five tools that TNC has been promoting. And then um, in, the in the latter part, half an hour, um, we will be uh, launching a new tool, um, a policy uh, related tool for uh, nature-based solutions. And so uh, it is a pleasure to uh, have here this very distinguished panel, um, which is composed, well, first I must say that I am Leonardo Lacerda. I am the uh, managing, the global managing director for TNC, uh, for our program that we call Tackling Climate Change. And uh, for some reason, can you please turn it on? Can you please turn it on? Ne next slide. Okay, so <clears throat> the one, the one back, please. So, as part of this panel, we have here to my left, Dr. Gao Xiang. He's the director of the Department of International Policy uh, at the National Center for Climate Change Strategy. Um, and international cooperation in China. He is a member of the Chinese delegation here. And unfortunately, he'll need to leave us uh, sharp at 3.20. So he will be uh, doing that and he, he's, uh, he'll be uh, excused to do that. And, and from Colombia, we have Dr. Alex Jose Saer Saker, who is the technical director of the, uh, at the Ministry of the Environment um, and um, uh, sustainable development uh, in uh, Colombia. And we also have a colleague, Diego Navarrete, who is the NCS leader for TNC Colombia. So, <coughs> next please. So in 2017, TNC and partners have developed um, uh, our researchers have identified that uh, nature itself with its own regenerative powers can actually help us to mitigate 30% uh, of what is needed uh, by 2030 in order for us to be on a pathway to 1.5 uh, degrees by the end of the century. So that is a lot um, and that uh, is about 11 gigatons, and that could happen in the areas of protect, manage, and restore, uh, in protection of forests, wetlands, and grasslands, or management of agricultural lands, uh, pastures, etc., and the more typical restoration we've been talking about uh, in restoring forests or uh, wetlands. Next, please. Um, and in achieving that, we have identified about 20 pathways uh, in order to achieve that goal. And that can go from reforestation to avoided forest conversion or nutrient management. What I'd like to call your attention here is to say that that mitigation um, is limited to 100 US dollars uh, in terms of its effectiveness. So we count it as if um, it would be achieving up to $100 uh, per ton. And in this graph, you see that there are some forms, some pathways that are actually cheaper. For example, avoided forest conversion is cheaper than reforestation, for example. And that gives us a sense of where to put some of the emphasis in deploying everything we can do in order to have NCS 
or nature-based solutions um, um, be a support to achieving our NDCs. Next, please. And, and what is key here is that in this graph you see that um, that effort is even greater uh, by t the, the date of 2030 by when the green part of that graph would represent about 30% of the effort. So with that, um, we have been in, in, in contact with a number of countries to have them um, deploy uh, and understand how for each of the countries they could do an assessment to see how to deploy all of these different pathways. And today with us, we have two examples of uh, these two countries, China and Colombia. And we would like to hear from uh, Dr. Gao how they in Colombia, uh, how they in China have uh, implemented uh, this assessment. Thank you, Leonardo, to give me this opportunity to participate in this very important uh, event. Um, the NCC, what to, where I'm working for, is the, in fact the think tank for China regarding to the climate change and uh, to make policy suggestions. And uh, the NDCs we have just uh, submitted before COP26 was also one of our um, research outcome, and we provide that to our government. Um, in fact, uh, we also have a very good relationship cooperation with TNC in China, and we have a very good research project, and uh, NBS is one of the topic we are focusing on in recent years. And in fact, uh, China is very proactively implemented the NBS to address the climate change and also other environmental protection issues, uh, because in our mind, N NBS, the Nature Based Solution, is consistent with uh, and also is a very useful approach to implement our concept of eco-civilization and to uh, share some of the uh, principles to, uh, with you about the eco-civilization. For example, we say that the, the man and, and, and the nature needs to co coexist in harmony and the lucid water and the lush, and the lush mountains are in value of assets and also we need to carry out a holistic um, conservation and the systematic governance of mountains, rivers, forests, grassland, lakes, and deserts. So these are some of the concepts we are uh, working under for the eco-civilization, and we feel NBS is very consistent with the concept we are uh, approaching for. And also guided by these principles, uh, China and New Zealand, we co-led the 2019 UN Summit on the NBS, and we uh, contribute to this, um, this concept of NBS to the world and uh, we try to help the uh, whole world to make the NBS into implementation and to address climate change. And we also, in fact, in China, we have a quite a long history to apply NBS to address different environmental issues, including climate change and uh, water, um, water and the biological conservation. For example, if you um, read our recent submitted in NDC, the National Determined Contribution document to the uh, new pupil C. It's, uh, it's available online, uh, and we have also English version for that uh, translation. Uh, you will see uh, we include many of the cases, and one of the typical cases for that is uh, um, we have a story in the back to 1962 in the, in the Mongolia, um, the local people work very hard to turn the desert back into a um, forest. That, that means they do a lot of afforestation. Uh, and right now, it is a very large forest area. And by this kind of actions, we have uh, both reserved the water and uh, purified the water and uh, 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 have a very good uh, contribution to the climate to address climate change because it's a large part of the uh, carbon sinks. Um, this is one case, and uh, in another case we also have in our national uh, determined contribution is about our new policy, and uh, we call it the eco, we, we, we call it the ecological red line policy, which means that uh, for those areas that have a very important ecological functions, we draw a red line, and uh, to protect these zones in a um, uh, hybrid way that uh, 
uh, different ministries and the different department, local ones and the different stakeholders will work together, both horizontal and uh, uh, in a vertical way and to, to collect the effort to protect this area, not only to say that um, to address climate change, but also to protect the environment and to uh, contribute to the bio biological conservation. So by, by this comprehensive thinking, of the under the under what we call the ecosystem uh, e eco uh, civilization and also like the NBS, what is more international term, I think we can uh, have when we have the comprehensive um, uh, design and then we can get achieve a, a very comprehensive uh, result. Not only focus on climate change, but we can have a lot of co benefits from different areas. So these are some of the um, the cases in China in in our um, policies. And, uh, but of course, in fact, uh, during this uh, policy implementation, we also feel there are some challenges for this uh, NBS and I would like to share with the, uh, the, the friends here. I think the first one is that um, the, the, the concept of the NBS is very good, but in practice, there are some challenges. For example, we need to tell the uh, decision makers what exactly we are going to do for NBS because sometimes we feel NBS is more like a concept and sometimes, for example, like the NCS, we have the 20 categories. They are, in fact, very practical approaches. So sometimes we say NBS to the uh, decision makers, they are asking us what exactly you mean and what kind of policy you need us to promote this kind of uh, either concept or this practical approaches. So this is something when we um, uh, uh, try to make the uh, policies, we have to make it very clear to the to the uh, policymakers what exactly they need to do. Um, and the second one is that um, we need to identify the value added of the using the term NBS. For example, before we have this term NBS, I think the, the earliest one we have that's in 2008. And before that, we already have, for example, we have eco ba ecosystem based approach. And we also have like the afforestation, refore reforestation, and in the agriculture, we have like the eco agriculture or green agriculture. We have several similar items, especially for specific areas. So what can we bring to uh, as value added if we use the NBS as a term to cover all, all of them? I think one thing is that just as I mentioned previously, it's a comprehensive thinking, not only focus on, for example, agriculture or forest, but we take everything together when we make use of the nature and the um, to have this uh, human human system get uh, get in harmony with the nature, so but this one is like at the concept level. When we're going to develop these policies, we have to make it clear what how to how to coordinate these different areas, and then this come to the third uh, challenges for us because in I, I guess in in every country, either in Colombia or in China, different ministries will have their different jurisdictions. So if you create the term NBS, so which ministry is going to take the lead? And how this ministry is going to um, cooperate with others? This is a very important thing. Uh, because this thing that we, I, I don't think we have a solution for, a single solution for every country because different countries have their own different national uh, circumstances. Sometimes, like for, chi for China, we have the Ministry of Environment, we have the Ministry of Resources, we also have the Ministry of Development. So who is going to take lead? Maybe we have our answer and solution, but the things will be different in Colombia. So I think these are three of the challenges after we uh, have this research together with TNC, we have identified several, but I think these three is something that if we wish to um, apply and to uh, have more uh, countries to implement MBS, these are some things that every country need to think about within their own national circumstances. I'll stop here, thank you. Well, thank you, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions that you would like to, to ask Dr. Gao before he leaves? Please, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased uh, to receive questions. Also from the audience, because he will he'll need, unfortunately, to leave. Please. Maybe a, a question that I will have is, how is the coordination uh, between the national level to the local level? Because sometimes it's uh, really difficult, at least in Colombia, to have those coordination 
uh, when there are different type of governments uh, and, and try to uh, and governments in the in the local level maybe prefer o other kind of solutions others than nature based solutions uh, which uh, the results are not that uh, easy to view from 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 the perspective of the long term uh, planning no? yeah thanks i think it's a very um, interesting question because uh, the, the case in china is that i think the kind of eco civilization is one of the guiding principle for both central government and all the local government mm -hmm. i think it is a different political system in, in china especially i think that's why I say different national circumstances. So in China, both the central government and the local government and even companies, they are following the development strategy of China, which includes the eco-civilization. So we will pay attention to this uh, uh, NBS nature-based solution issues in different uh, level. Uh, but in, in, in specific cases, uh, it depends on whether this issue is cross Cross boundary of different provinces, or it's a special local ones. If this is local ones, then the local government have the uh, stronger voice on that. But following the general guidance from the single uh, sim uh, central government. But if this is a, for example, like the ecological red line policies, it's a national wide one. So the national uh, government, uh, especially the Ministry of Environment, will take the lead. And the different the local local uh, government, then they will organize their own um, the mapping or the zoning, and they report this uh, proposal to the central government. And central government will uh, certify that. So this is the the, the, the case in China. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to congratulate China for having committed to uh, achieving a neutralized uh, achieve neutralization before 2060. Um, and in order to make that commitment, uh, some very important uh, uh, NBS tools were, were used, including on the stock of, of wood. Could you describe a bit to us how, how were the internal discussions about getting that uh, NBS uh, tool uh, as part of the, uh, of the overall commitment? Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, well, I think many of the colleagues are quite interested in our uh, 2016 uh, carbon neutrality target. Uh, well, it's, it's quite far uh, uh, far away, in fact. But uh, uh, during our discussion, I think not only to say that uh, contribute from the nature, because like just you uh, demonstrated that it could contribute to one third. Of, of course, this is for the 2030, but for us, it's uh, 2016. But uh, I think we should do um, do things in both hands. On one hand, to mitigate, to do the mitigation, traditional mitigation from fossil fuels, yes. from industries, and to reduce the emission. And on the other hand, we will make best use of our nature, um, uh, I think, from, from two aspects. The first aspect is to increase the carbon uh, things, especially from forest, from forest and like the wetland and uh, other grassland to uh, increase the carbon sinks and uh, the other uh, aspect is to make use of the nature, especially like the, like the green, as I mentioned, we, we say it's a green uh, uh, agriculture and uh, something um, to, to reduce the emission from agriculture sector and the LULUCF sector. And by that way, I, can, I, I think we can achieve our target of new carbon neutrality before 2016. But we're still doing the um, detailed um, a strategy and detailed plan for that. So right now we have published our general guidance for that and you can also um, have that online in English version, we have that. You can have a look, thanks. Mm -hmm. We have time still for one last question. Any, anybody from the, the group would like to ask Dr. Gao? Yes, please. Hi, thank you for that. Um, I was just um, curious as to what does the role of uh, the carbon markets also play in um, in the China pathway? I just wanted to get like your thoughts on that. 
I, I should borrow this one. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think uh, the carbon market is one of the most important uh, policies in China to uh, achieve our NDC target. And, uh, uh, but right now, I think the carbon market uh, covers only the power sector, the uh, fossil fuel power sector. And we are planning to expand the coverage of the carbon market in the, recent, uh, in the following years. And at this moment, the carbon sinks is not included in the national tar carbon market, but we have a voluntary trading system in China regarding to the uh, um, uh, credits uh, resulted from the uh, forestry uh, ac actions. So uh, it is right now more like a voluntary thing that, for example, the companies, they wish to buy the credits and they can do that. Thank you. Well, I think, I think it's time now for you, Dr. <laughs> Gao Xiang to, to go to your meetings, but we wholeheartedly thank you for being with us and good luck on implementation, as we said, you know, on going from, from assessment to real implementation on the ground. And it will be a pleasure to continue as a partner with China on this. Uh, thank, thank you so very much. much. Yeah. I, I sincerely apologize that I have to go to my negotiation item, but very glad to see all of you here. Thank you so much. And uh, as, as we continue, I'd like to share now five different tools that uh, TNC and partners have developed. Um, next slide, please. Uh, before we go uh, to the case study also in Colombia. So first tool, so we developed, uh, we've been developing a number of tools that can help with decision making. Uh, as countries need to delve into this issue and say, well, how can we overcome? How can we really implement? As we said, well, how do we go from assessment to implementation, as Dr. Gao said? So the first tool was what we call mapping the natural climate solutions opportunities. So this gives you a sense in, in the whole world. So we took the, the 20 pathways and we looked at each one of them and for each country, and seeing where do we stand the best chances of implementation. So the darker green represents the countries that are um, offer the best opportunities for the cheaper way of implementing the, the uh, nature-based solutions. So this tool, you can have access through the natureforclimate.org. You just write N4C mapper and you get it, it's fascinating. You can see each one of your specific countries in it. Um, another tool that uh, will be, uh, is still embargoed, but will come out soon, is to say that, you know, although we talk a lot about uh, restoration as a key tool, actually, uh, because uh, we are constrained in terms of time, and because we are constrained in, in terms of money, um, we try to establish a hierarchy of in between protect, manage, and restore, what are the best options, the soonest and the cheapest. And so you actually come up with a different uh, global picture in the sense that protect should come first because that avoids a lot of the deforestation that needs to come out. And then manage actually is a, a larger part. It offers a lot of opportunity, particularly in agriculture, you know, in nutrient uh, and so on. And restore um, has an incredible opportunity, but it's more longer term and it's a bit more expensive. So um, next slide, please. And as we look at the, the different pathways, for example, on, manage, on management, um, a key aspect of management is managing of forestry. And so we've been working on improved forestry management uh, methodology. Uh, next, please, next slide. So that we uh, go away from the current uh, uh, models that we have to identify what are the opportunities here in, in the sector to, um, particularly with a view of improving the carbon accounting aspects. So currently we set baselines based on a series of assumptions. 
this new model is much more um, dynamic and it actually measures the tree, the actual tree growth. We don't have the time to discuss all the details, but the key here to understand is that we now have much better methodologies that enable us to uh, do a better uh, uh, carbon accounting in management of forestry. Next. And, and then the other question is, okay, restoration is interesting, it has a huge potential. The most interesting potential of restorations is actually on secondary growth areas where natural regeneration is already happening. But then we asked ourselves, but what are the best places for these to take place? And again, this map shows us where carbon accumulates faster in the world. And again, you see it's a lot of it is in, in, in South America, uh, Central Africa, and Eastern, uh, uh, Southeast Asia. But that gives you a pretty good sense you know, for investments. And as we discuss here about Article 6, those things are really key to say, well, where do we build efficiency in a system of uh, uh, natural uh, forest regrowth? Next, please. And then the last tool that I'd like to share is that we have supported now five countries to, to do their assessments uh, for the NBS, uh, how to integrate these NBS into their own uh, NDCs. And, this, and then with that experience of five years in five countries that includes the US, Canada, um, China, uh, Indonesia, and uh, Colombia, we have developed this handbook, which actually uh, is also a system of decision making and what, what are the key steps that a country that would like to enhance its uh, uh, NBS on NDCs can do. So I'll stop there and let's go now to the uh, exciting uh, Colombia case. And I'd like to ask you, Alex, to speak to us about what you went through, what Colombia went through. So th thank you very much, uh, Leonardo, for, for this opportunity to talk to the audience today. Uh, my name is Alex Ayer, Director for Climate Change and Risk uh, Management in the Ministry of Environment in Colombia. Um, I, I want to give first like a, a, a context of what's happening in Colombia and what's the context of uh, emissions, uh, uh, carbon emissions in Colombia. So 55% of emissions in Colombia come from the deforestation and a follow, no? So 33% comes from deforestation and 22% uh, come from land use and land uh, and agricultural uh, activities in Colombia. So there is a there is a focus on our NDCs, which we submitted on December of last year, where we committed to a 51% reduction on uh, emissions uh, on a 2030 basis. Um, it's a strong emphasis on how we protect our nature and how we protect our uh, ecosystems. And in that way, how can we reduce uh, the emissions, carbon emissions, uh, using this kind of, of solutions. So one, one of the principles of the main ones is how can we avoid deforestation in our country? First is to recognize that deforestation in, in Colombia is not, um, the, the cause of deforestation in Colombia is not to expand the agricultural uh, activity in our country. Deforestation is most linked to illegal activities in Colombia, uh, like uh, land ownership in Colombia, uh, many resources that comes with, uh, with, from illegal activities uh, are put into uh, deforestation in order to keep land as an asset. No? So one of our main um, focus on our NDC is how, how can we avoid deforestation through two different pathways. 
The, fir the first one is to enhance security in this area in order to cut all these um, illegal activities that are happening into the country. So that's why we launched uh, CONALDEF. CONALDEF is a, like a big round table where the presidency, the, um, the, the judges, uh, the local authorities, and other national author authorities works in a, a collaborative uh, way in order to prevent deforestation. And the other one is local development. How can we give uh, uh, local uh, communities some options on some development options in order them to uh, get incomes from the forest uh, and in order to uh, give them productive opportunities to um, try to not be part of the deforestation scheme that is uh, being uh, developed by these illegal activities. Uh, last year, we issued the crime, uh, environmental crime law. It's uh, one of the first environmental crime law uh, globally, uh, where we put deforestation as one of the, uh, as an environmental crime, which was not uh, been done before. And that is giving us tools to prosecute uh, all these illegal activities that are uh, happening with uh, deforestation. But then uh, these nature-based uh, solutions and uh, natural climate solutions come into place as a, a complement and as a way to reinforce uh, the security uh, pathway that are, we are, are being implementing in Colombia to reduce deforestation. And that's, um, the, the, we have a program called Vision Amazonia, with, uh, uh, that is a um, um, pay by results program uh, supported by the um, uh, German government, Norwegian government, and the UK government where we are implementing this kind of natural-based solutions in order to protect the Amazon uh, in, in our country. Then uh, we also launch, uh, uh, as, a, as another program, a 180 million uh, uh, trees. Uh, and we are working not, not, not only focusing on planted trees, but that is tied with a goal of uh, restoration of 300,000 hectares in Colombia by 2022. So, but we needed like a easy number because uh, like the citizen doesn't know what is a hectare or doesn't know what is a, to restore a, a hectare in Colombia. So we needed a simple language in order them to understand what the government is doing and in order them to be part also at the different parts of the society, in order them to be part also in this program. So we are working in a, this 180 million program. We already uh, um, uh, accomplished uh, 80 million uh, uh, trees in, in only three years. So. That program is uh, a really good one since we are um, getting to the program, not only the national government, but also the local government, the local authorities, and also the schools, because we are trying to uh, give um, the opportunity to know and to get involved in all these processes we have uh, around the restoration in Colombia. Also, we have a very interesting program. It's the first blue carbon program in the world is being happening in Colombia, in Bahia de Cispata. We are working with eight local communities in order to keep the mangrove, uh, which are which captures like the mangrove ecosystems, it captures ten uh, times the carbon that the natural forests do. 
So there is a really good opportunity uh, to have local development with communities uh, which are working to protect these areas. And this is a great example also of NCS uh, activities. Also in Colombia, we have what is called paramos. Maybe not, not many people know what is a paramo. It's a high mountain ecosystem. 70% of the water that comes to our cities, uh, to goes to our cities, comes from paramos. It's a unique ecosystem from Latin America, and Colombia has um, approximately 52% of all paramos globally. So these are extremely important ecosystem, and we are working with some cooperation in order not only to uh, protect the paramos, but to measure the capacity of paramos to storage carbon, which is a methodology that we are uh, developing uh, with uh, the collaboration of, of, of some cooperation. So in our indices, uh, we recognize that these climate solutions, natural climate solutions, are really important uh, to reach uh, our goal of 51% by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2050. In fact, we want to reduce to zero deforestation in 2030. Uh, this year, from January to June, we reduce uh, deforestation by 34% compared to the last year, uh, given all these um, measures and activities that we are doing in Colombia. And another, another that is quite uh, important, and I, I'm going to invite all the, 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 the people that, are, that, are, that is here. We are, um, how, how do you say that? We are, um, we have, we, have, we are going to develop, we are developing a program which is called One Million Corals. So we are, uh, we are creating nurseries uh, to grow one million corals, corals uh, in Colombia. So in our pavilion, you can see there are some uh, Googles that you can see like in a 360 degrees view how corals are being grown uh, in, in our ecosystem. And that's, that's one really interesting solution because you need a lot of involvement of the community doing the, the, all this nurturing and all this coral growth. That is one of the main advantages of this, of this kind of solutions. There are not great solutions. Uh, you, there, are, there are no technological solutions that many of them come imported. But this kind of solution needs of the local communities, need of the involvement, not in the short term, but in the long term of the local communities. And that could help us in the reactivation, in employment, in social development in our country. So there are many examples that we are doing right now. And there are some of them uh, that you can find in our NDCs as well as our, in our long-term strategy of Colombia. Thank you, Dr. Alex. Uh, any questions? Yes, please. Percy, thank you so much for a, a, this really extraordinary um, uh, contribution to your NDC. Um, I wondered how you ensure the permanence of your tree planting schemes, given they're coming under the NDC. So the permanence of the tree planting uh, program? Yeah. So. What, what we found when we launched this program is that there was no tree available. There was no capacity to grow them. There was no land to grow them. So, so, so we started working on the uh, conditions that uh, will um, make this program success. We, we were facing too many struggles to, in order to put this program in place. So right now, 
we are working in all those conditions. So for example, in uh, trees availability, we have been working with local governments, with uh, environmental deteriorates of the local governments, in order them to uh, teach them how to uh, grow like the, the, the small trees, yeah, uh, like the grow. Also to create the infrastructure that they need. Uh, so we, in the Ministry of Environment, we secure some funds in order to do some um, um, uh, MOUs with the local governments to give them not only the funds, but also the knowledge uh, so they can uh, uh, put that in place. In Colombia, we have um, really good uh, research um, institutions uh, that are tied to the Ministry of Environment, the Humboldt Research Institute, the CINCHI, which is the Amazonian uh, Research Institute, the IIAP, uh, which is the Pacific uh, Research Institute. So they have the knowledge and the capacity, but they don't have it in a scale. So we put them to work with the local authorities to give them the knowledge and the capacity, and the local governments uh, have the scale to build it up. The second one is working with the companies. They have compensation plans. Uh, when they do their infrastructure, um, uh, the, their infrastructure projects, they have to do compensation. Uh, but that compensation was not like guide before. So we found with this program like a pathway then to, to do all the compensations in an orderly, orderly manner. Uh, uh, so companies are not only um, having the commitment of planting the tree, but maintaining the tree at least for three years. So that's, why, uh, that's how we are assuring that uh, the mortality rate re uh, reduces a lot. And the other way is to um, work. Um, we, we have an authority called SAI, which manage all the assets that are being kept, or I don't know how to, kept from illegal activities. So these assets land. We are doing also um, MOUs with them, um, convenios, I don't know how to say convenios, um, with them in order to get land to grow, the, to grow their trees and do like also association with uh, the local governments to manage of this land. So we are trying to, just to, to, to wrap it up, we are trying not only to grow the trees, but at least secure the maintenance for at least three years, uh, which uh, give us like a big opportunity to, to assure the, 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 the development of, of these ones. In fact, we have an ArcGIS uh, website where you can find where the trees are being planted, uh, which departments of Colombia, who is planting these trees. There are um, um, ge geo reference. Uh, of all the plantings that we are doing. So you can, uh, next government, when, when, when next government came, uh, they can follow up on this, on this program. Well, thank you, and I, and I was thinking about asking you now, Diego, one, one thing. Um, Colombia has made a, an incredible and bold uh, move from increasing from 20 to 51 percent um, its uh, mitigation wishes by 2030. And that's probably one of the biggest moves I've seen from any other country. And I understand that NBS ideas were critical for that. So from the perspective of an NGO, and then I'll ask you again, because I'd like to hear the, both uh, uh, opinions. What made that magic? What, what happened there? Thank you, Leonardo. I wanted to start saying that at the beginning of this conversation, 
Alex told me, this is a beautiful pavilion. And I thought, yes, well, there are some tables there. It's nice. But then I thought, it is beautiful because it has trees and yeah. some plants. And, and this is the power of nature. This is the, what nature does. Gives us tranquility, gives us a beautiful landscape. And at the same time, nature gives us solutions, natural climate solutions, nature-based solutions. So Alex said that in Colombia, most of emissions comes from these, uh, these uh, sectors, deforestation, uh, degradation, uh, conventional production, etc. These emissions came from, from that, but at the same time, nature, avoiding deforestation, restoring uh, natural ecosystems, can provide most of the mitigation that the country requires to achieve 2030 goals and, and, and even 2050 goals, of course. So what, what we need to do, what, what Colombia needs to do, is to work together with nature, take this advantage, this cost-effective uh, initiative, this cost-effective technology, which is photosynthesis and etc., and work and provide, for example, some alternatives uh, by generating some um, uh, alternatives, business alternatives around restoration or deforestation, etc., in order to promote and, and to promote natural climate solutions and nature-based solutions, and to keep an, an opportunity for local communities and uh, for business companies to invest in these alternatives. There are in Colombia some instruments that, allows, that allow to, to invest and to continue um, supporting these initiatives. Colombia has a carbon tax. Colombia also has uh, some alternatives, for example, uh, payments for results like RED plus payment for environmental services, etc. So it is important to continue strengthening and supporting this initiative. Science supports the amount of mitigation that this initiative can provide. Science also supports the amount of co-benefits that these initiatives can provide. In TNC, we produce this uh, research in which we know how much mitigation for example, avoiding deforestation or, or restoration can provide to mitigate climate change, but also to improve biodiversity or to improve water supply or even to improve governance. We have this information. We can work together based on this information to prioritize areas where to, to go to, to establish some projects or some initiatives around natural climate solutions that at the same time are cost effective and can provide these solutions that we require and at the same time be an alternative for local communities, for companies, etc. Thank you. And you might want to answer the same question. So re referring to the to the bold move, our our NDCs uh, are not only a number, fifty one percent uh, m many people could uh, think that it's, it's really high um, and it's only a number. But when you, uh, when you read our indices, you can find that there are 196 actions that supports that 51%. In fact, we have accounted for 37% of that 51% and we are doing our research uh, that we call it the gap, gap research um, in order to know how we are going to fill the other 14% that we have left. So 196 actions that has responsible indicators, uh, conditions that uh, are to be met in order to comply with that actions so they are very structured. And of those of that 196 uh, actions, 30 of them are 
uh, adaptation actions. And that's our first adaptation communication to the UNFCC um, uh, here. So it's a, it's a really strong NDC that we have put in place, uh, but that uh, is a result of uh, work of at least two years uh, identifying these kind of actions that are not only being right or done by the Minister of Environment, those have been worked with all the sectors. That, that's, uh, I think, is the most important uh, issue of our NDCs. In fact, we have one of those actions is the NAMA, NAMA Ganaderia uh, for cattle ranching. Um, um, we are in this Nama Ganaderia. We are uh, we want to implement a silvo silvo pasture uh, systems in Colombia, which I have to recognize we are kind of a way of of what is going internationally, but we we have like a really good uh, goal around that to to implement at least. Five to eight million hectares to 2050 on silvo pastures. Uh, we have pilot programs in Colombia that supports uh, that kind of solutions, and the uh, main association, cattle ranching association in Colombia, is supporting that, which is really important. The only thing that uh, uh, or, or the barrier that we have is a, is a long-term strategy. Like establishing silvery pasture, you need a lot of money and you see the results at least in 20, uh, 10 to 15 years to increase the productivity uh, that we need and to capture like the carbon. So, but, but we are in that way and we are working towards them. Can I, can I super please? Yeah. Thank you. Um, there are some information or some projects developed in Colombia. One of them is uh, the Sustainable Cattle Ranching Project, which has been implemented for the last 10 years, something like that. And results are re really good, not only in productivity. There are some evidence demonstrating that silvopastoral systems can improve productivity in terms of milk and, and, and beef, etc. But also, there are some results about the mitigation potential that cattle ranching, that sustainable cattle ranching can provide to mitigate climate change and also to provide some biodiversity. And the amount of carbon that uh, the NAMA, the cattle ranching NAMA uh, has in the, in the NDC is, is huge. It's about 11 million tons, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So yeah. if the country can implement this kind of activities, this kind of sustainable cattle ranching, n the country c not only can provide a better, um, a better context for cattle ranchers, but also can contribute to mitigate climate change and to, to achieve the, the, the NDC goal that the country has. Excellent. And uh, any questions from the audience? I, I, I do have a, I do have a question um, for for you. Um, when we we've seen uh, changes in government, and how to ensure that, in spite of changes in government, uh, policies and ideas actually stick. Okay. What what was the you were both experienced. I will ask you first, Diego, and then, and then you, Alex. Well, the first, the first thing we have to do, I think, is continually being communicating with the government uh, from the results we produce every day. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Alex also mentioned these uh, very strategic ecosystems and unique ecosystems called paramos and mangroves. In TNC, well, we started working on three, three natural climate solutions, avoiding deforestation, forest degradation, forest restoration, and silvopastoral systems. Now, we are working on paramos. We are developing some 
NCS pathways in order to produce information that can, that can demonstrate uh, with very accurate values the mitigation potential that this value, that this ecosystem have. Mm -hmm. So what, what we have to do from, from the NGOs, from the civil society, is working very close with the government of Colombia mm -hmm. in providing this support, mm -hmm. saying this is the science supporting our findings. And of course, trying to be quite connected despite mm -hmm. of changes, etc. But yeah, I think this yeah. is the... Uh, that's a great solution, uh, it, uh, a question, sorry. That's a great question, mostly uh, because of our, um, on our Latin American context, which governments uh, uh, change a lot, mm -hmm. no? and change in, uh, in ideas as well. So one thing that President Duque has done is put environment to the top agenda. And he has been one of these presidents that have linked, in fact, uh, and wanted to link the, um, all the, the focus of the climate change uh, COP with the biodiversity COP. So, so how we, we link those, those two ones. But at the local level, we have our NDCs, but our question was, okay, how can we assure that our NDCs are, co are being uh, complied in, in the future? So that's why we draft uh, a bill called Climate Action Bill that has all the goals of the, our NDCs. Mm -hmm. So you look at the bill, that we put it into Congress uh, two weeks ago, and all the bill has our NDCs on goals. Mm -hmm. And we managed to bring most of the ministries, the Ministry of Transport, Agriculture, and also to have some uh, allies at the Congress in order to present the bill. Mm -hmm. We have had, we had the first debate of the bill and we were afraid that the lobby started to cut down the, the, the goals. But what we found, because we did a previous work with the, with the companies and the associations and the productive sector, is that they wanted to be up. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, that if we wanted to restore, I, I'm gonna say uh, a, a random number, 10,000 hectares, and they wanted to be 50,000 hectares. Mm -hmm. No? So I think that's a really good exercise to have our indices put it into law because next government has mm -hmm. to comply with. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we are trying to assure that uh, next governments uh, follow up what is stated in our indices right now. Well, and this aspect of policy is a great link to what comes next. Uh, first, I would really like to uh, thank our panelists for what they said today. We saw here two very clear examples of two countries that are massively important for, for climate globally uh, that have adopted um, a very clear increases in their um, uh, NDCs because of the application of um, NBS. So, and so in this domain of policy, then we need to, to, under, to understand, well, what are we learning ab ab about it? What, what are the current policies that are, um, that are already designed? What are the ones being designed? Um, and for that, I'd like to invite James uh, to launch a new uh, tracker, an NBS uh, tracker. And I'd like to uh, ask for a round of applause to our very distinguished guests. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leonardo.
Okay, yeah. Get that breath in there. Whoop. Don't worry, I'm not checking my text messages. I've just managed to write my notes on my phone, so I'm not being rude to you and multitasking here. Um, thank you very much to the last panel, and I think actually what's great about this pavilion is the diversity of some of the messages you're going to hear. But the one thing that, just before I start, is just to all take a moment in this room and just take a breath and just centralize ourselves of where we are just feel that power of nature. Just take a deep breath. We're here and be active listening. So I'm really interested in using this session not just to present to you, but to actually to hear some questions about where we should be going next and what we should be doing as Nature for Climate. So my name's James Lloyd. I'm the director, the lead of the Nature for Climate as a coalition, which is a coalition of 19 international organizations. Um, it's a big acronym soup, so I'm not even going to go in through all the acronyms, um, especially in case I miss one out, which happens to be sitting here. That would be very embarrassing. Um, but it's a number of UN agencies as well as um, international NGOs and IUCN, which has its own class of organization. Um, what's great about Nature for Climate, we were set up on a very clear mission. Our mission is to deliver as close to the connective tissue that allows us to deliver by 2030 the ambition scale of the Griscom 2017 Natural Climate Solutions paper, which talks about, if we're being kind of safe, about 10 gigatons on the ground from nature-based solutions or natural climate solutions through those 20 different pathways that you saw earlier. And very much when Nature for Climate was set up, we did some analysis that went along with that paper that showed that although it could be a third of the climate solution, the near-time climate solution, at that point, it was less than 1% of the conversation, and it was less than 3% of financing, of mitigation financing. So we kind of realized, actually, although the science is really clear, there's a big area around both strategic communications, strategic advocacy, and then ultimately the policy environment to enable that scale to work. And when we say nature, just putting this really clearly, we mean all of us as well. We are all part of nature. This is our ecosystems. We live in them. So one really important part where we look at this is that the first part is protect. So that is about protecting those intact ecosystems, that irreplaceable carbon that once it's gone, we will not be able to replace. And that's a lot, a lot of the conversations focused on. And actually what Leonardo showed you earlier was a really important paper that's about to be launched. And I think I'd really, it's actually not a difficult one to read as far as academic papers. I really worth reading it because it sets out a hierarchy here. So protect is critical. We protect those ecosystems and those communities that live within those ecosystems that are essential to the 40% of biodiversity that some of the indigenous communities are guardians of and manage. And that's a really critical part of the conversation. But I'll take that as read. The second part here is the piece that actually as we go through our analysis, this becomes quite interesting, is the manage part. So that's our everyday places, our landscapes, our cities, our agricultural lands, our working lands, and the normal everyday processes of how we manage those places for carbon, but also for people and for biodiversity uh, and for the multiple benefits that they achieve, the natural capital flows that sits within them. Um, and then finally, the restore part, which is critical. And there's some fantastic announcements coming over the next few days on the restore part, especially from that really fantastic leadership that's going on in Africa. We don't often hear about the kind of African leadership on climate change. We hear a lot about, from South American colleagues, about the protection that's going on. But actually, some of the restoration work that's coming through is fantastic. So that's an exciting kind of lead of what's coming up. But the manage bit, I'll go back to that. So the one area, what we wanted to do, was taking the kind of grisk and the science that everyone's seen and then looking at the kind of case studies that we know is happening on the ground. So this isn't a debate about definitions. This isn't a debate about if we like the word nature-based solutions or natural climate solutions. It's a debate about what's actually happening. And it is happening in different levels. And it's about driving quality at scale and speeding that up. Because we got to 2030, we need to do this the first time and we need to do it right the first time. We haven't got a chance to go back and do this twice. So that does mean about delivering the human rights and the co-benefits as we do that. 
So that's an incredible important part of our policy analysis. But we got the NDCs to varying levels, and some NDCs are fantastic. Um, they can all probably go further. I'm not going to let anyone off the hook here. Everyone can do better. We can all do better. Um, but every country can deliver them. This isn't just about a north-south argument. This is every country in the world can deliver nature-based solutions. Um, all countries, all habitats, all ecosystems. So that's the first thing when we look at the science there. The NDCs, so there's, ga there's gaps in the NDCs, which we know we can do better. But that's just the start of the story. You, once you've got an NDC, we need to now look at the policy environment. And the policy environment is the facilitative environment that enables nature-based solutions to happen. This isn't just nature-based solutions for climate change or natural climate solutions. We're looking at nature-based solutions as a whole because ultimately we know that by 2030, if we move to a nature-positive environment, a uh, kind of economy, that there's tremendous benefits for jobs, for people, for biodiversity, for, for human rights, for indigenous. We can meet our SDGs and we can meet our CBD, our, our Convention on Biodiversity Commitments with the same solutions if we do them well. And that's an incredible prize. And interestingly, when you talk to my friends in politics, get it more sometimes than NGOs, because NGOs often have our very narrow areas of research, our swim lanes that we all work in. And actually, politicians get this. They get the value of doing this well. So what needs to happen? So we said, look at this. How can we look at this in a different way? <laughs> so um, Nature for Climate, being fans of nature tech, which you'll find out more about over the next few days. And there's some great nature tech leaders in the room here, I can see. Cat at the back, can you wave? Um, <laughs> nature metrics there. Um, what we wanted to do was use a, a very unbiased, objective look at as many countries as possible about what the policy environment was. So it's not just by us, based on our own, where we kind of spent years in a rainforest, we know this country well. This was using AI. So it's a great pleasure today that I'm going to, in, in a minute, announce, uh, introduce to you Louisa, who's done the research behind this. And it's a whole new approach of using machine learning and AI to look at policy. Um, it's not perfect, and I'm going to be very honest with anyone, but this is a continual three-year program of improvement. So by the stock take, we can get to a much better real-time monitoring of policies around the world as they develop. But the aim of this is knowledge sharing. It's not to point fingers at people, and it's not to point out who's good and who's bad. It's to say, this is what's happening. We can learn from this. We can share. We can connect you with different governments. So that's the critical. It's about a nurturing, listening environment. It's not one for us to go, hey, they're better than them. That's not... What we also can't do is tell you which policies work and which don't yet. We're just looking at where those policies are as the first time. So just going to put in the context which is important in all these conversations. To help this process, I'm going to introduce to you next, which is Patricia. <laughs> and Patricia is the newest member of our team at Nature for Climate, but has been, we've been coming in for a few weeks, <laughs> has been lent to bring in, and we've had a, a piece of work going on for the last two years of crowdsourcing with lots of researchers across universities, across the world, looking at case studies and starting to look at where is it happening, where are nature-based solutions delivering, and what's significant about them and how they're working. So it's building on the shoulders of a great team of volunteers that couldn't be here, um, but I just want to recognize all the volunteers, researchers, and some people have basically just said, this is going to be my dissertation now, I love this. I'm going to take the, the crowdsourced research and turn it into my, my dissertation on, on, on nature-based solutions, which is great, because they're going to be the next generation of leaders, these, youth, these student researchers. So that's, that's the context behind it. Now I'm going to hand over to people much cleverer than me. Louisa, <laughs> who is like, can explain to you how algorithms and everything work. Um, Louisa is from uh, uh, Metabolic, who has done, how do I explain it? Amazing job on this, when I probably phoned you up and said, help, Louisa, how can we do this? We've been told you're good at this. Um, I'm going to let you introduce yourself in the background. And then after that, Patricia is going to talk through some of the case studies. And these are two new tools that are being launched today. But ultimately, we're going to launch an even better tool, hopefully probably at Stockholm, plus 50, which is going to bring all of this together in one place. So you can get a green thread from the science, through the NDCs, through to the, the uh, policies, through to the case study. So if you're a journalist, you can write a story just by looking at this. You can plagiarize it. I don't care. Just, just write the stories. Uh, if you're a financer, you can do some of your pre-scoping on it. So you can look at where's the environment, what's the kind of opportunities for investment. And if you're a country going to embark on this, you can go, who's already done this? Let's find those practical people that have written the policy, designed it, and we can help put you in contact. So it's a tool to help our performance, but the aim of doing better is the aim of this. So before any more, this is Louisa. Thanks. Oh, you've got a <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here for the launch of the Nature-Based Solutions Policy Tracker. Um, yep, great. Uh, so 
at Metabolic with Nature for Climate and also our research partners, our AI research partners at Arboretica. We developed a nature-based solutions tracker. Really, this is the first proof of concept uh, for creating a tracker using AI. Um, and uh, what it does is fill a, track, a gap in the climate policy tracking arena. We have a lot of climate policy trackers out there, and none of them yet are focused on nature-based solutions. We know that nature-based solutions are such a big part of the NDCs, and we really want more visibility there. Um, we developed this tracker uh, first by developing... Um, First, by developing pretty clear science-based criteria, understanding what uh, nature-based solutions need to be successful. Like James said, we're not looking at the outcomes of the policies, but rather looking at the science, seeing what science says about outcomes, and then seeing what's written in the policy itself. So we want to see funding in the nature-based solutions policies. We also want to see indigenous people and local community knowledge incorporated into these policies, preventing fortress conservation. Um, we also want prioritizing protection uh, and sustaining natural ecosystems rather than really um, trying to rebuild. Also, we want inclusive policy that has many different stakeholders, levels of government, um, different community members involved in every level. Uh, we also want monitoring, reporting, and verification. Columbia was earlier talking about how monitoring is such a big part of their uh, nature-based solutions policy, and that's great to hear, and we'll talk a little bit about, about that later. Um, we also want these policies to be um, at a landscape level. So rather than looking at small parcels of land and small change, understanding like how a landscape operates, an entire wetland, a whole mangrove area, a forest, these types of things. Um, so you can see underneath each of these criteria, we've, we have some keywords, and this is what we used uh, to search. So if you want to go back to that other slide. I can talk a little bit about the process of how we developed the tracker. Um, so first, we collected uh, many, many sources. We scanned probably mil uh, over a million websites using uh, an algorithm that had key uh, criteria, key semantic search terms, and key policy search terms, act, uh, legislation, subsidy, budget, these types of things. We then, from this collection of hundreds of thousands of sources, got more specific at what we were looking at. Um, we collected, uh, we further investigated those sources to make sure they were actually relevant to us. Um, and from there, we qualified even further to make sure that there were actual policies. So we're looking at um, anything open source on the web. It could be direct, so uh, an actual policy article. It could also be indirect, um, a report about a policy, highlighting a policy, for example. Um, and then from there, we did a lot of manual validation. So we would manually validate, pick out randomly, uh, manually validate, and then feed that information back into the system. And so the policy qualification and validation was really an iterative process. We did three or four rounds of manual validation, and uh, the search got smarter each time. Um, and I can now share a little bit about the outcomes, what we've come out with. We have over 220 policies that um, cover uh, over around 80 countries. Um, so quite a range of policies. And all of these policies are, are uh, collected since the Paris Agreement was signed uh, at the end of 2015. Um, we have over 25 different nature-based solutions categories represented in these policies. And some of the results that we found are really innovative uh, templates for success. And Patricia will go into further some of the examples of the templates for success that we found, uh, great case studies of policies um, that are implemented and, and really showing what that criteria looks like in action, which is really great to see. Um, and 90% of these policies recognize 
um, the importance of that multi-stakeholder piece, knowing that if it's really one government agency or one group coming up with a policy, it's probably not going to be very successful without uh, input from others and, and ownership. Um, so that, that was probably the biggest insight we've had. 48%, almost half, include indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, 44, focus on landscape level interventions, which is also nice to see. 67% um, have allocated budgets. We're really, really looking for policies that are funded. It's very important to see where the money is going, who is getting financed. Um, that's really where action's happening. We want market mechanisms, finance. Uh, investors need to know where to spend their money, what is effective. Uh, we also saw 62% had very clear monitoring, reporting, and verification plans, which is also super key to success for nature-based solutions policies. Um, and I think now I will pass it over to Patricia for uh, delving into some of the examples a little bit better. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. I think uh, it's important for us, uh, since we understand we're all looking at NDCs, and then we're looking at the policies that are happening nationally. So then what's actually happening on the ground, how that interacts. Um, so we, we did an exercise which is creating this case study map for this COP. Um, we compiled around 60, uh, I think it's 67 the, the current list now, but we're aiming for 100 by, by the end of this conference and that work is gonna continue on. Um, and they, these are, are examples of practices that do combine good practices that are happening on the ground, and at the same time, some lessons learned that have happened from, for example, uh, longer projects and how they have evolved over the years. Um, and they are also sorted uh, according to the three, uh, to the three criteria that we talked before, so protect, restore, and manage. And um, we have some big plans for, for this and trying to integrate everything. Um, I'll talk a little bit further on. Uh, but what I did now, what we brought to, for today is just a quick exercise of how we can, uh, we can use those two tools and exactly what, what are the possibilities. So we start with, we're starting with Colombia. Um, I think it, it's, we've already seen from the previous panels um, how the, NDC, the enhanced NDC uh, target, uh, it's, it's happening, and there's so many good projects have happening there, and the policies the, uh, also support those projects. So for one of the policies that, that did came out, come out from the policy tracker was the Pacto por Colombia, which is uh, the national development plan, and that has an allocated budget of three billion uh, for sustainable development, and it has a, lo a very big focus on stopping deforestation. Um, so we, ha we also have from a list of really good projects that are happening on the ground. One of those is the Planeta, which, is, uh, which aims to, to, to protect 39,000 hectares of forest. And they, they do a direct link to premium uh, price payments. Um, so the local farmers, they have more profitability and more sustainability uh, to, to have the palm um, growing instead of uh, timber or rubber, or rubber activities. So that's, uh, uh, for example, one of the links that you can th think about when you understand the, the policy landscape at the national level, and then you also see what's happening on the ground. Uh, another one is on Kenya, and it's a smart agri agriculture st strategy. Has also a 50 billion uh, budget to enable um, NBS through through in the integration of farmer livelihoods, um, and uh, there's a law. There's also a very clear um, mention of indigenous knowledge and how to use them to inform the policy and to inform the the practice. And one of these examples is the livelihood mount, where they do use uh, and they 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 do use the knowledge, the local knowledge, and also uh, try to cover and to scale this up to 300,000 uh, family uh, farms. And also 50% of those people that are receiving this training are women, which is also a really good uh, uh, measure. And the next one that, that we brought was Nepal, and it's an agroforestry policy. 
that uh, has a very innovative, they, they, ha they use a geospatial assessment to understand where and which trees should be planted and how and all of the assessments. So that's actually um, a very good, uh, it's very good to be mentioned a lot the way it is in, within the policy. Um, and then we do have a, a, a few examples of uh, that put in place and a lot of co conservation corridors and also a very uh, clear, a very clear um, worry to preserve biodiversity and to, and to protect the species. So this, uh, it's a little bit of an example of what you can do. I think uh, one of the, the things that we did, um, that we did collect from this exercise is that we, this was a, a crowdsourced uh, source, um, endeavor. We have received so many submissions, so many indications, which does show that there's so much action happening on the ground. There are so many stories that we need to tell and that we're not telling. A lot of times we're trying to prove the same point over and over, but there are so many pro uh, points to prove. There are, uh, so um, I think what we we're trying to do here is just to provide with a set of tools where you can explore more and go beyond the, you know, the, the superficial line of storytelling. Um, the, our project is to integrate some of the tools that Leonardo just mentioned, for example, the World Atlas, where, which assesses the, the mitigation, and then we're going to turn this into an NCS action mapper, and that is going to combine all of the relevant scientific and political data that we can uh, regarding NBS and NCS for uh, every country on Earth and so that we can really drive, uh, boost more, more, more action and more invest investments and better policies uh, for nature based solu solutions. So it's going to compile uh, the policies. So from the tracker, um, the case studies that, that we've been compiling, so all the map, the mitigation potential, and also the NDCs, and hopefully in one, uh, one big um, two interactive tool that's going to be available for everyone. And the idea is to launch that by the stock take. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, you. Thanks, Louisa. We're just gonna, before we do the, the next step, well, let's, we want to go and ask some questions from the audience. So um, is this mic working as well? Turn it on. Oh, that's simple. There we go. <laughs> simple. Um, technical face solution. Um, any questions for any of the panel members or other people? There's probably people might have perspectives in the audience as well. I thought, yes, here we go. Can I pass that back? Thanks, Sarah. If, you, if you can say your name and where you're from as well is useful, just to give context sure, to the question. Thanks. I'm Jess Ayers. I'm from the Children's Investment Fund Foundation. Oh. This is very cool. Hi, um, I, know, <laughs> um, I know you said um, you weren't looking at outcomes, but I'm interested in whether you have in your database um, the, the KPIs of all of those policies, which presumably have them, because I think it would be really, really useful to have that database of you know, the, the outcomes and objectives intended in those policies so that we could start to track and collate and aggregate and work out how they interact with the NDCs. So. Mm. Thanks, Jess. I mean, Louisa, do you want to say what data we've got? Because it's for sharing, and I'm sure with Jess, with your help, we can build on it um, and deliver some of that. But um, do you want to say what exactly what data yeah, sets in we've the got? Yeah, in the um, <laughs> database itself, we have uh, the, the link to the policy or the source that the policy came from. Um, so hopefully, people can follow that, but with the automated uh, web scraping, it is easier to figure out exactly what we want to pull from those uh, from that data and then compile, so that's a great idea. Mm. Thank you. So just to, just to add to that, we, we, our idea was that this is a three-year project up to the stock take, um, so we want to define it, and actually, because ultimately you and the audience here are probably the users of it, it'd be really helpful to understand how we can define it and make it a, a tool of the commons. You know, all this data is open. There's nothing we're protecting on it. We do want it to be used. So if there's ways we can tweak that to make that more effective, if there's data sources that we can pull in, then ultimately that's what we're trying to do. And we've you know, got friends in the coalition, WWF's about to launch a, a, a much deeper analysis of some of the nature and MDCs. I'm just plugging for, the, for later on this week. But we want to pull down some of the partners' data so there's ultimately a place where it's an index. It's not trying to claim it. It's just trying to help make it easier to navigate. Um, and then if you want much more academic level case studies, the Nature Based Solutions Initiative based out of Oxford has got some of the best 
peer-reviewed and academic, but often the academic, even the grey literature, is, is, is later than some of the stuff we're getting out um, from, from other sources. So it's a kind of ecosystem of knowledge, but ultimately sharing it. And just a point on that, what's really exciting here, a lot of this is Southern-led. These policies and, and ways of doing stuff, and I think there's a lot more we can do to take this Southern knowledge and take it Northern, because actually some of the countries that are lacking on this, certainly around manage, is some of the, what we traditionally see as funder countries, but actually they can deliver nature-based solutions as well. So there's something, I think, in this South to North knowledge transfer around nature-based solutions that we should embrace more and help, because I think that's a really important part of the climate debate that we don't talk about often. So, yeah. Thanks so much, James. Thanks for the plug for a report we'll be launching on Friday, looking at NDS, uh, NBS within all NDCs file to date uh, to see uh, how much is actually in there. Uh, a really good initiative. I think it's going to be super useful over the next two and three years, hopefully over the next decade or two uh, as well. Uh, two questions methodologically, which are going to be a challenge. Sorry, Louise, I'll put you on the spot. Uh, but one is, we've done web scraping before for other initiatives. When you run into, how do you deal with different languages so that we can be sure we're covering a lot of the world and keywords tend to be different, I think is one challenge. The second one is, how do we deal with very low quality NBS that we perhaps don't want to celebrate or we do want to point out versus high quality NBS? Thank you. Uh, great question, thank you. Uh, we have maybe faced that dilemma together, the uh, English language, um, and one way of doing that, which is what we did in this, um, so we only searched in English for this, uh, which leaves out a lot of important information, um, but a lot of policy and then uh, Journalism around policy is in English, so we did find quite a broad range of uh, countries covered by this. Um, but I think there needs to be more work. Uh, and so in this short proof of concept, we were able to scrape in English, and then we hope to develop out further in other languages. And so what it looks like is identifying characteristics of policy um, that the machine can read. So for example, we have uh, identified that bullet points uh, or certain keywords identify policy markers for us now. And so really doing the research to understand what that looks like in other languages uh, to be more inclusive. Um, and your second question is about how do we uh, highlight the best templates for success rather than every policy out there that uh, mentions nature-based solutions. And I think that's a really good point, especially because we're not measuring outcomes. We're just measuring good policy. And, and luckily, there is a lot of science on what good nature-based solutions look like. So understanding what that looks like when written is also fairly easy. And so what how we've approached it in this project is having our six criteria, which we also do hope to expand. Um, but and identifying which policies meet which of these criteria. So rather than saying what a, a, is a good policy or a bad policy, more objectively saying they are meeting or not meeting that criteria based on our research. So uh, that's the approach for now. I'm going to take one last question. This lady's got a hand up there straight away. <laughs> and then we'll have to close after that. It should just be a quick one. Um, hi, I'm Ethne from the Institution of Environmental Sciences. Um, and I just had a question about the granularity in terms of the policies and case studies that you're looking at. Because obviously local government are often at the forefront of actually implementing nature-based solutions. So is it just national policy and national case studies? Or do you go more in, in depth into local, uh, local policies as well? That's a good question. We definitely targeted national policies with this research. But if we found great, more local ones, we kept it in there because there's no reason to exclude it, yeah. Uh, and then on, on the case studies, I can answer that. We, we were specific, every case study should be place-based. What we wanted to avoid where we've been at summits before, there's a lot of pledges out there, but we wanted to understand what place-based nature-based solutions and then what we can learn from that. Now, over time, our aim is to carry on the crowdsourced way and working with, certainly if there's any students out here, is working to understand and go deeper and deeper and understand what's significant, because it's not actually what's necessarily good or bad about a policy, it's what's significant. What's the learning from that policy that tells us? So if we were to do it again, we could do it differently. So almost we want to know about things that have failed 
as much as things that have succeeded. And we get away from this binary, is it good or bad? But actually, what can we learn from it? How can we improve? And I think that's ultimately the real question that we need researchers and work universities to understand, is what is the learning points from everything? Even the good ones, we need to know, what wouldn't we do differently? You know, and, and I think that way, we can deliver towards this kind of the role of nature in policy. Yes, the granularity thing is on the action mapper. Uh, I don't know, we want to go more um, non-state actor level regional, but it's getting the right GIS data to be able to start to say what are those, eco those landscape scale interactions that you want to do, which will take time. But we want, hope we can work with people. This is collaborative. We're not trying to own this, but we were reaching out to say, how do we make this more collaborative? So certainly up to the stock take, we can get 10 gigatons in NDCs that is done well with safeguards the right way, because we're not gonna get another chance if we get to 2023, 2024. You know, that's, if we wanna hit 2030, we need those pledges, policies, actions, funding now, and then drive it through. So this is about how we work as a community to be more analytical on this debate, rather than just being, oh, I like MBS, I don't. You should call it this, you should call it that. If we have to go through any more of that, we're all gonna fail. Ultimately, it's how we do this well is the test that we'll be judged upon. Thank <laughs> you.